intestine. Otherwise, otherwise the small intestines will be, um, otherwise iron absorption will be hampered. So again, the daily requirement is one to two milligrams is usually sufficient, but it's higher in individuals for other physiologic reasons. So individuals who are pregnant, undergoing menstruation or breastfeeding will require more iron. Unfortunately, we can increase the amount of iron that we take in our diet, but we can't control how much blood and iron we lose. We can't excrete iron easily unless we are bleeding. And so what really controls the amount of iron is by controlling the amount of iron that we take in. Iron and MDS, before we talk about iron and MDS, just a quick comment on myelodysplastic syndromes or MDS in general. The definition for MDS has been very complicated for decades. This is one of the definitions. MDS or myelodysplastic syndrome um, form a group of clonal hematopoietic stem cell malignancies characterized by ineffective hematopoiesis in one or more cell lines is associated with peripheral cytopenias, and there's a risk of transformation to acute myeloid leukemia or AML. So you might be wondering, what the heck does that mean? And so one of the ways of thinking about MDS goes back to my predecessor, Dr. Robert Barr, uh, Bob Barr, and his Ford Pinto. Um, so he's always compared the myelodysplastic bone marrow to a Ford Pinto factory, I guess. And so uh, Ford Pinto back in the 1960s or 70s um, apparently was very highly uh, combustible. Uh, so with just a slight bump, it can, it can uh, be destroyed. So a bone marrow factory uh, of somebody with MDS is like that of a car factory where the car is made with some defects and it could break down faster on the highways. So just like uh, the cars and car factory with these defects, the MDS factory with its defects in the red blood cells, white blood cells, and platelets, they may not survive as long. So in other words, MDS is a group of blood and bone marrow disorders, which are forms of cancers, where the blood cells are made with these defects and they don't survive as long as they should. And that leads to one or more of these blood cells, whether it's your white blood cells, your red blood cells, or your platelets, being reduced in number. Although it's considered a type of cancer of the bone marrow, it's not yet a leukemia on its own and can be considered a pre-leukemic condition because it can eventually um, mutate further and become an acute leukemia. Again, it is not one disease and often behaves differently in different people. So you can't compare one person with MDS to another person with MDS easily because they may have a totally different disease altogether. What is the impact of MDS? So somebody diagnosed with this condition where their bone marrow factory isn't working so well is that for the patient, they can have a very poor quality of life. If their red blood cells aren't made correctly, then they may have to import other red blood cells. And that is a blood transfusion. But a blood transfusion can take time and commitment to get to a transfusion center. And it takes time to sit there and get the infusion in, which can take sometimes upwards of two to four hours. There are complications, which we're gonna talk about with too many transfusions of iron overload. Patients without adequate hemoglobin, meaning they're anemic, can have those cardiorespiratory symptoms. Again, they can feel very short of breath, have chest pain, they may in fact require hospitalization for cardiac complications. If they don't have enough white blood cells or white blood cells that are functioning, they can have infections. If they don't have enough platelets or platelets that are functioning, 
and they're higher risk of bleeding. And they can have an increased risk of that transformation to leukemia. So all of those reasons can lead them to be hospitalized. And they have an increased risk of a shorter survival. What is the impact to society for patients with MDS? Well, transfusions are not a limited, sorry, are not an unlimited resource. Transfusions are very expensive and limited resource depending on our donor pools and the processing for them. And the burden on society is that more and more patients with MDS are diagnosed and can end up in hospitals because of all of these complications. Part of the management of MDS then is transfusions. The mainstay of management is really supportive. And supportive, what we mean is that for some patients, they may need transfusions or antibiotics to support them through their symptoms and when their hemoglobin is low or when their white count is low or when their platelets are low. Unfortunately, there's no specific threshold either. There's no one size fits all. You might say, is there a hemoglobin level at which I need a transfusion? Well, it depends on not only your hemoglobin level, it depends on uh, your symptoms at the time, whether or not you have underlying heart disease, lung disease to begin with. Individuals who have predisposing heart disease and lung disease may need a transfusion sooner than somebody who may be younger, who is completely fit, without any symptoms, and have no heart disease or lung disease. So you have to take that into account as well. For the most part, for those of you who've had a transfusion, you know that typically that level of transfusion threshold is a hemoglobin roughly between 70 and 90, for example. So some patients may need a transfusion when their hemoglobin is below 70, and another patient may have a transfusion when their hemoglobin is 80. But iron can also be a problem when there's too much iron. We said too little iron is bad, but too much iron can also be bad for the body. And where do we get all of this excess iron from? Well, a transfusion, and this is an example of a bag, a unit of a transfusion, which contains roughly uh, 250 to 300 uh, milliliters of packed red blood cells in here. So again, if your body isn't making the red blood cells quite right and they're low, you can import another person's red blood cell. So this is a donor red blood cell. And roughly each bag of red blood cells will contain about 250 milligrams of iron. So that's a lot of iron. So if you have two units in a transfusion, you'll get 500 milligrams of iron. If you have 10 units of iron uh, of red blood cells, let's say you get two units every month, then in about 10 months, you'll have 10 units. If you were getting transfusions of two units once a week, and after 10 weeks, you would get 20 units of red blood cells, that would be about 5,000 milligrams. That's more than double the, uh, the total amount of iron a typical adult will have. So remember that we said the daily amount of iron that our body takes in and loses is about one to two milligrams. So this is 5,000. The total amount of body iron any average adult has ranges between 3,000 and 5,000. So now you've doubled the amount of iron in the body. Where does all that excess iron go? Well, remember iron or free iron that's floating around in our bodies is actually very toxic to the body. It has to be tightly regulated. So that iron is typically bound and trafficked through a protein called transferrin. And typically 
the transfer molecules in our blood are only about 30 to 50% saturated with iron. But when you have all that excess iron from transfusions, well, we're gonna overwhelm the transferrin molecules. There's just not enough transferrin proteins to carry all of the excess iron. That excess iron then spills over as free iron, not bound to anything. Something called non transferrin bound iron or NTBI. So these non transferrin bound iron, these free floating iron, then can go to various organs in our bodies and cause damage to the liver, to the heart, and other organs. This is another cartoon representation to show us that that excess iron can dam damage the organs in the body. Recall that the intestinal iron absorption is about one to two milligrams a day, and that one to two milligrams of iron a day is bound to plasma transferrin bound iron. So it's bound to transferrin and there's no issues with it. And as well, the body's old red blood cells are broken down and it's also then trafficked by transferrin. So typically that is not a major problem. But with these bags and bags and bags of red blood cell transfusions, that excess blood doesn't live forever. That excess blood degrades and also has to be uh, recycled. That excess iron recycle from those red blood cells has to go somewhere. And that somewhere is that it overwhelms the transferrin molecules. And that excess iron then becomes non-transferrin bound iron and then accumulates in the various tissues in the body from head to toe. So again, various organs from the pituitary to the parathyroid, the heart and liver are big ones, pancreas and gonads. So it can affect a lot of areas in the body. It is also hypothesized that that excess iron may actually worsen the MDS condition and perhaps even promote leukemogenesis. So MDS, we believe that it occurs by a random mutation in the stem cells of our bone marrow. And just to back up a little bit, these mutations are not mutations that are carried down from one generation to the next. These mutations occur in the stem cells of our bone marrow factory and only are related to the hemato poietic cells, meaning that it only affects the cells that make, the stem cells that make our red blood cells, white blood cells, and platelets. They're not the mutations then that are carried on to the next generation. So MDS uh, typically isn't a mutation that you have that you pass on to the next generation in general. With these mutations and these abnormal clones of cells. It creates an environment where you have lots of inflammation as well. And most of the time that management and supportive management may need to be a blood transfusion. Again, with excess blood transfusions, you can have excess iron and become iron overloaded. That excess iron and non-transferrin bound iron causes a lot of disruption at the cellular level, leading to different reactive oxygen species, or ROS. And these reactive oxygen species can further promote these stem cells in the bone marrow to mutate further, leading to what we call clonal evolution. And that MDS may progress to a higher risk disease or further mutations leading the increased risk of becoming leukemia. So excess iron is associated with poor outcomes, increased risk of leukemia, and damage to all of these organs. So how do you know if you have iron overload? Well, there are various tests to see if you have iron overload. 
Some of the simplest ones are blood tests. One is called serum ferritin. Another is called transferrin saturation. With excess iron, a lot of that iron goes to various organs like the liver. So you can actually calculate how much excess iron there is with something called the liver iron concentration or LIC. The gold standard has always been to do a liver biopsy. But you can imagine that is very invasive, sticking a needle into your liver and taking a biopsy of it every time you want to know how much iron you're accumulating. And as well, recall that patients with MDS may have lower platelets, and that increases the risk of bleeding. So you don't want to be poking around all the time with a liver biopsy. So less invasive things are imaging, imaging such as MRI, something called the Ferry scan, which is an MRI of your liver, and with a proprietary software, it determines the amount of iron based on the MRI results. There are different types of imaging. This is called something called a squid. And then you can also image the heart as well to see how much iron is accumulating in the heart. All of that is really to prevent the excess iron. So you know where you're starting from, and then perhaps you can intervene and prevent the accumulation of further iron into those organs, such as the liver or the heart. But these, these are sometimes, these imaging are very difficult to access or not available sometimes. So the easiest and cheapest is the serum ferritin. The pros of it is, again, it's very inexpensive and easily measured. It could be done with your routine blood test. Again, it's not part of your CBC, the complete blood count, because the complete blood count is not really complete. It doesn't include things like your iron levels. So the serum ferritin is a separate blood test that you have to order. It allows then for frequent monitoring, and it is positively correlated with morbidity and mortality, meaning that the higher your ferritin has been associated with a higher poor outcome. The cons of it is that it is not a perfect measure of how much iron is in your body. It's an indirect measure of the iron burden in your body. And the reason for that is that these levels are influenced by other factors, infection and inflammation. Ferritin is considered an acute phase reactant. So any type of infection you get, the ferritin jumps up. Any inflammation in body, the ferritin jumps up. So it's not a totally reliable measure. You may have to uh, require serial measurements or use serum ferritin in combination with other indicators to truly know if you have iron overload. However, in the optimal setting, in general, you can say that most people have a normal iron stores if their serum ferritin is below 300. But you should, again, look at the laboratory parameters for the lab that you go to, because they may have different levels for what is normal. Typically, we start thinking about mild, moderate iron overload when the ferritin is above 1,000, less than 2,500, and considering severe iron overload when it's over 2,500. Another iron parameter is called the transferrin saturation. It is useful as a complement to the serum ferritin for the diagnosis of iron overload. So you probably want both your serum ferritin and your transferrin saturation. So remember we said transferrin was the transporter of iron. Uh, and the typical saturation can be anywhere from 20 to 50%. So when you have a transferrin saturation that's over 50%, meaning you have all of this excess iron and it's saturating your transferrin molecules uh, above 50%, it's indicative of a iron overload state. It's not really useful though it, for a lot of indications. It's, it has some limitations, not useful for monitoring long-term trends in iron burden. It can't uh, detect or unable to detect iron overload caused primarily by something called the reticular endothelial system. And it's not as reliable as the liver iron concentration in estimating total body iron. 
So not as good as getting a liver biopsy, of course, because the liver biopsy is still the gold standard. But again, a liver biopsy is very invasive, uh, fairly expensive, and um, very risky as well. So are there other ways that we can use to determine how much we expect iron is in a person's body? Well, one of the surrogate markers could be the number of transfusions. If you have a lot of transfusions, then uh, we would expect you have a lot of iron in your body. There's no particular number of units of transfused blood that has been prospectively validated. These are really based on expert opinion that suggests that by the time you get to 20 units, 25 units or more, up to 50 units, you probably have a lot of excess iron in your body. Um, it should not be the sole index to determine how much iron burden you have, uh, because there are some patients with MDS, certain patients with a subtype of MDS, where they might get iron overloaded even before 20 units of red blood cells, for example. And there are others who may need a lot more red blood cell transfusions and don't become iron overloaded because they may also have concurrent bleeding. They might be bleeding out that excess uh, blood that they're getting transfused. So we do have to take the full history to, to estimate what the ideal amount of iron we think they may have in their body. And the serum ferritin, again, is probably a good non-invasive, cheap way of measuring. In the literature, a lot of different guidelines suggest when it's over 1,000 or 2,500, we should be thinking about iron overload. But keep in mind, it's not perfect. It's affected by inflammation, infection. And we should probably think about starting in a medication called iron chelation which binds the excess iron when, not, not just with ferritin alone, but when ferritin and the transferrin saturation is above a certain threshold, like about 50% for the transferrin saturation. So what can we do about it? If you have an, one of these underlying conditions and you were found to have excess iron, uh, there are therapies, there are medications called iron chelation therapies that uh, can help remove that excess iron. And if you remove that excess iron, the question becomes, does it even help? You know, you have excess iron, but does removing it do anything to improve your outcome? So there are some data, albeit not very large studies and not uh, great large randomized prospective studies, but there are studies looking at iron chelation and how it may benefit patients with MDS. So this was a study uh, done by uh, Dr. Alan List um, and uh, team. And what they did is they retrospectively looked at their patients who were iron, on iron chelation in the first line here in orange, those who are on standard or high iron chelation therapy. They looked at their patients in a second line here with low iron chelation therapy, so a small amount of medication, and those patients with MDS who were not on iron chelation. And they just followed those individuals um, along. This is number of months, and this is what their survival was. So at the beginning, all those patients um, were surviving, and then uh, over time, individuals passed away, unfortunately. And they looked at their survival curves for each of these three groups. And you can see that the group that had no iron chelation um, had more and quicker death rates. So their median survival was in this group. So the average survival was about 49 months. Compared to the group that got a little bit of chelation, their average survival was about 69 months. Compared to the average survival of those who had standard chelation, meaning they got adequate amount of uh, medication to remove the iron, was about 120 months. Okay, so there was this signal saying, maybe for those patients who had MDS and iron overload, if we put them on iron chelation, they may survive longer. 
but this is a retrospective study, and all retrospective studies may be confounded by the fact that we're not really looking at the effect of the intervention, the medication here, but we're seeing is that just three groups of different MDS patients. The first group was a group that was more sick to begin with, and obviously their death rate was going to be higher. And they were sick enough that the physicians didn't feel like putting them on yet another medication. Whereas the group that got the standard dose of iron chelation medication, that group was a much more robust fit, younger population that they would have put on and tried different medications. So that's the problem of retrospective studies. We're not comparing group to group. So another group did a retrospective study, but instead they compared two groups and um, they tried to match each group uh, based on their age and sex. So this was a retrospective study as well. So not a great perfect study, but a total of 188 patients, 94 in each group. And they looked at the 94 patients who had iron chelation, and for each of those patients, they found an MDS patient who was the same age and sex, but was not on iron chelation. And they grouped those patients together and they compared them, these two cohorts that were matched on age and sex, um, and showed that in these two closely matched cohorts, that the group that got iron chelation, their median survival was about 74 months compared to the group that uh, did not get chelation. So a little bit better way of comparing these age-matched cohorts, but still not perfect. There was a study done in Canada, out in uh, BC, a small retrospective study, but it was a long duration of time, about 25 years experience, 178 MDS patients in that cohort, 18 of whom received iron chelation therapy. And the iron chelation therapy they received was with something called uh, deferoxamine, which was given um, as 0.5 to three grams per day and required an infusion of 12 hour infusion, five days a week. And what they did is they looked for the ferritin levels, cause of death and overall survival in those groups. And what they found was that the group that got iron chelation therapy, only 18 of them, of course, but um, they found that their pre-iron chelation therapy, their ferritin level was 4,215, so quite high. And it came down to 2,659 over the course of their follow-up. But in the group that got non-iron chelation therapy, they were not chelated their iron levels increased, and that's expected because they were still getting transfusions. And in this comparison of the 18 versus the 160 that didn't get iron chelation, the only things that they found that could help predict their survival was their original scoring system for MDS called the International Prognostic Staging System Score, which tells us how um, good or bad or MDS was, and iron chelation. So iron chelation seemed to independently predict a better survival. So those who had uh, been on iron chelation, uh, when they followed them for at least 160 months for all the patients in the lower uh, risk groups on the IPSS score, their average survival was not even reached on the iron chelation but it was reached to about 40 months for those who are not on iron chelation. So all of these studies are suggesting, but not definitive proof, that maybe iron chelation helps patients with MDS and iron overload. It also seems to not only help them in their survival, but it may also help improve their hematologic parameters. And those hematologic parameters not only is red blood cells, but it might also improve their neutrophils, which is a type of white blood cell. It can help their platelets as well. So in different studies, 
with different sizes of studies. You can see in the first one by Celoni et al, that in these patients with lower risk MDS, they had shown that after three months that their red blood cells seem to have improved. Dr. Allen List et al in 2012 in about 173 patients in, with lower risk MDS showed that some of their patients, 15% had improvement in their hemoglobin, 15% had improvement in their neutrophils, and 22% had improved in, in their platelets. Again, um, showing that along with all these other studies that perhaps excess iron is toxic to the bone marrow environment and getting rid of that excess iron may actually help your bone marrow make red blood cells, white blood cells, and platelets. So if it is helpful and something that you and your hematologist uh, talk about, how do you even get an iron chelating medication and what is available in Canada? So there's actually three forms of iron chelation in Canada. One is this deferoxamine, which again is comes in a liquid that has to be given intravenously into the body. So it is very involved. You actually have to get a pump um, and an IV administration set and that liquid then uh, is uh, slowly infused into a vein in your body. Whereas the other two that's available in Canada, this is uh, the ferroprone uh, with the label ferroprox uh, made by Apotex. And then X-Jade, oh, I don't have the other brand name called Jade New here, but they're all tablet forms uh, that you can take. X-Jade was this uh, tablet that had to be dispersed um, and, and then you would take it uh, uh, as, as a drink in a liquid, whereas Jade New is just a tablet, just like um, Ferroprox that you would uh, take like any other tablet uh, with a sip of uh, water. And there are pros and cons to each of these. So Deferous, uh, the deferoxamine, again, is this injection or infusion. Because it has such a short half-life, it doesn't come in a tablet. It has to be infused in. Um, and then it gets extruded in a urine stool. That This is the recommended uh, daily dose, but it's infused in. So um, subcutaneous is uh, underneath the skin, and IV is into the vein. Uh, but it's very, very involved. It would require about eight to 12 hours of infusion a day, five to seven days a week, where you're attached to a dancing partner, a, a pump on a pole with the IV administration set. So not ideal for a lot of our uh, patients with MDS who are often older with other comorbid uh, conditions where they may not be able to um, manage the infusion and administration of that infusion. Um, so tablets are probably the most ideal. Again, deferoprone or deferocyrox. Deferoprone is ferroprox. It's an oral extruded in the urine. Uh, there's the recommended daily dose and it's an oral agent given three times a day. Deferocyrox, again, can be uh, the generic, or sorry, the, uh, is the generic name but it's uh, marketed as X-Jade or Jade New, is an oral tablet excreted in the stool. The good news is that it has um, a longer half-life. And, and so because of that longer half-life, it can be taken once a day, which is even more convenient. So we're gonna focus a little bit on Deferocyrox as well. Um, and funding for it uh, in Ontario. So I apologize for those who are not in Ontario. Uh, you have to uh, ask uh, your uh, hematologist as to what the uh, local funding for it might be. So uh, Dr. Dick Wells et al. in 2008 published his Canadian Consensus Panel uh, Guidelines for when we should consider starting iron chelation. So if you have a diagnosis of MDS, the question is, when should you consider starting an iron chelating medication? And for the most part, it's considered for patients who are transfusion dependent, meaning that you have a 
diagnosis of MDS, but you're also getting transfusions on a regular basis. For those individuals um, with MDS and have a good prognosis, so on these scoring systems, you're on the lower end of the um, risk for um, that disease, then you can consider it when you're serum ferritin, that again, that measurement is above a thousand. Or for some patients who are higher risk and are going for a stem cell transplant, it might help reduce the peritransplant morbidity and mortality associated with the transplant. And it should be considered for those who have a life expectancy over a year. Uh, again, iron chelation uh, should be initiated if there's any evidence of iron-related and organ damage, such as the heart or liver, or those who have a ferritin above 1,000 and their uh, transferrin saturation is above that 50% or 0 0.5, uh, and perhaps irrespective of the number of units of uh, transfusions. Th this is not, of course, set in stone. Um, and there are several considerations for starting iron chelation therapy. Obviously, if you have an MDS and your physician wants to start you on another medication to reduce the transfusions, perhaps it's important to consider starting one medication at a time rather than starting all these medications together. In case you have side effects, you won't know which is causing the side effect. So, there's a bit of an art to this as well. It's not completely a perfect science that um, you have a type of MDS, you could get a certain medication, you could get iron chelation and you start everything together. You probably want to uh, have a discussion with your hematologist about when to start various treatments. There are other recommendations, not just a Canadian consensus recommendation, uh, this is the NCCN, um, and this is the MDS Foundation recommendations. They have different characteristics. Uh, one is transfusion status. The NCCN suggests uh, when, when somebody's received more than 20 red blood cell transfusions and they're still needing transfusions to consider starting iron chelation. Um, the MDS Foundation feels that if you're transfusion dependent, meaning you're getting regular transfusions and you require at least two units of red blood cells every month for over a year. Uh, with the caveat, of course, that your serum ferritin is above a certain threshold for the NCCN above 2,500, MDS foundation above 1,000. So you can see there's some variability in the recommendations as well. And the MDS category, if you're in the lower risk, intermediate one risk, category or in the MDS foundation. Also, they take into account the WHO categories as well. If patients are going for a allogeneic stem cell transplant, if they're a candidate for what's called an allograft, an allogeneic stem cell transplant, that's something iron chelation is something to consider. If you do decide on iron chelation with your uh, hematologist, um, then once that decision has been made, uh, you can either consider one or the other. Uh, these recommendations were made before uh, deferoprone was approved in Canada. And uh, it could be deferoxamine, again, in a subcutaneous or intravenous infusions, or deferocyrox, which again is given as a pill once a day, which is often easier. These medications are associated with side effects as well, like any medication. So it's important to look for those side effects. Uh, deferoxamine was associated with, albeit uh, very low risk, of uh, ocular and ototoxicity. So ocular, um, it's important to see an ophthalmologist and get an examination done before and annually thereafter. With audiometry, it's looking for ototoxicity, so hearing problems. So you get an audiometry test before and annually thereafter. We also have to keep an eye on the blood counts. Again, the white cells, red cells, and platelets. Perhaps there's some improvement, but perhaps it can cause some of the numbers to drop. The ferroprone, 
which is now available in Canada as Ferroprox, for example, is notorious for being associated with a very low white blood cell count, specifically a low neutrophil count. As well, uh, kidney function is important to monitor, especially for Defrocyrox uh, here. Okay. And so what is available in Ontario? Again, I apologize for those outside of Ontario. I'm not familiar with your funding uh, structure. Um, recently, as this year, January 31st, 2022, um, there are generic versions of Defra, uh, Cyrox. So Defra Cyrox, uh, the trade names and brand names are XJade and Jade New. Um, but now there are generic versions of them. So generic versions of Defrocyrox that you might see is PMS Defrocyrox, Apo Defrocyrox, Sandoz Defrocyrox, and Taro Defrocyrox. And these are covered by um, Ontario via uh, um, OD, ODB, which is the Ontario Drug Benefit Plan. So uh, who gets covered under ODB is that obviously you have OHIP and your age 65 years of uh, age or older, living in a long-term care or uh, a home uh, for a special care, or you're receiving some professional home or community care service, or you're enrolled in Trillium, or you're covered because you're on Ontario Works or Ontario Disability Program. So uh, these would be all covered now. If you still believe in the brand names, um, then to get those, it may be covered in certain clinical settings as well. Okay, so that's Ontario. It's easier to get Defrocyrox than it was before uh, January 31st, 2022. If you are starting on one of these medications, then your hematologist and family doctor will continue to follow you up for various blood tests and uh, recommendations. The routine recommendation is to perhaps do weekly, uh, sorry, uh, monthly visits for the first three months, and then every three months thereafter, you'll get a set of blood tests looking at not only your ferritin, but uh, looking at your thyroid, liver enzymes, kidney function, glucose as well. And uh, for some people, they may need urinalysis uh, for excess proteins. That annual audiometry and ophthalmologic assessments are important. And for some people, they may also need um, an echocardiogram done looking at their heart. Dose adjustments may also be needed when somebody is on iron chelation, depending on their side effects or depending on if their ferritin is uh, um, coming down appropriately. Okay. So in summary then, um, iron is essential in the production and function of hemoglobin and our red blood cells. Too little iron is one cause of anemia called iron deficiency anemia, but again, anemia, meaning low hemoglobin, can be due to many different things, aplastic anemia, myelodysplastic syndrome, etc. But too much iron can also be detrimental to the body, and we've seen that too much iron, that excess free iron that floats around, can be damaging to the heart, the liver, etc. It seems that the number of red blood cells transfusions you get can contribute to iron overload and iron overload itself are often neglected issues in MDS, but it's an important part of MDS because it seems to predict a negative outcome for survival. So perhaps in patients with MDS and getting excess transfusions, iron chelation therapy should be considered uh, for individuals with MDS with iron overload due to these frequent transfusions. So with that, our hope is that the bone marrow factory of the future, as per uh, Dr. Robert Barr, is that one day we will make that bone marrow factory better. And uh, perhaps we don't have to talk about uh, all these iron chelation therapies because people hopefully won't need as many transfusions uh, in the future. Okay. So hey. any questions? Um, yes, we have a question here. I'm gonna allow George to speak. Go ahead, George. Okay, could you talk a bit? Can you hear? Yes, I can hear yeah, you. Yeah, we can hear you. 
Thank you. Um, the iron chelation and um, reduced kidney function. So uh, which uh, type of drug and which kind of treatment is appropriate when you are down to uh, sort of 30% or somewhat less than 30% of kidney function? That's a really good question. Thank you for that, George. I, I don't know if everyone heard that question. The question is that, um, if you have uh, somebody who has reduced kidney function, um, what iron chelation can you consider uh, of the, the three iron chelation uh, that's available? And uh, what do you do for that uh, individual, perhaps with um, low renal function where it's only 30% of their uh, overall function? So here, th this is a good um, uh, diagram of a uh, table of the different um, available iron chelators. And the ones that rely on the kidneys are the ones that get excreted through the urine. You can see uh, deferoxamine, deferoprone. Um, but deferocyrox doesn't rely so much on the kidney function. And so what you have to do as well, George, is that often the next step is that when we look at these medications, we look at the product monograph, which tells us for each drug what you do uh, based on one's uh, renal function or kidney function. And so we would look at deferocyrox for you, find out what your creatinine is and what your um, creatinine clearance is based on that creatinine level. And based on that creatinine clearance, we look at the product monograph and determine if we need to reduce the dose of your deferocyrox and by how much. And so everybody will have a slightly different dose of their iron chelating medication. Now, if it falls below a certain range, then uh, deferocyrox or any of these medications may unfortunately be out of the question until that creatinine improves. Okay, so this is a really good and something that you, your hematologist and your pharmacist will look into and make sure that that dose is right for you. Do we have another question? Sabine, go ahead. Yes, hello. Hi, Hi. this is Sabine. I'm from Montreal, uh, Quebec. Hi. And um, I have a question concerning, I did have a bone marrow transplant January 14, 2021. And um, we noticed through, I needed an MRI for the ovaries, and we noticed that I have a lot of iron overload in my liver. Um, that's probably because of the blood transfusion I received prior to the bone marrow transplant. I mean, for a year I was living on blood transfusion. Um, my ferritin level right now, I mean, the last one they measured it actually, was in July was 1,151. And um, I have a hematologue appointment coming up in two weeks. And I wanted to know um, if I should start reducing it already. Is it dangerous for my liver, pancreas, whatever? <laughs> or is it something that might go down by itself? Or should I avoid also iron as a food that has iron inside? I don't know. I'm not sure what to do. So um, maybe you can help me. That's a great question. Thank you for that. So the, the question is somebody who has undergone a stem cell transplant. Mm -hmm. um, and my question to you would be, since your stem cell transplant in 2021, have you needed any further transfusions? No. Uh, well, that's wonderful. So if you haven't needed any further transfusions, then you are no longer transfusion dependent. Exactly. So that, that's really good. So your ferritin is above a thousand, but gradually over time, that ferritin level will not increase because you're not getting any further transfusions. And over time, that ferritin level will hopefully start to decrease. And so okay. you, you'll probably have ongoing monitoring for your ferritin uh, levels. But um, iron chelation, again, because of its potential side effects and so forth, uh, and somebody post stem cell transplant, it's not necessary to be on iron chelation at that point. Okay, mm -hmm. so. so I know, 
Oh, sorry, I noticed that in March, it was one, this year, March, it was 1,255. It went down to 1,020 in May, but it increased to 1,151 in July. I assume this is uh, due to food? Yeah, uh, so uh, again, remember that ferritin uh, is not quite perfect. So that ferritin will fluctuate by many other factors. So you could still have post-transplant. Uh, some people are at higher risk of infections and inflammation, things mm -hmm. like graft versus host disease, medications exactly. that yeah. you take. And so the ferritin may not be perfectly representative of how much iron you have in the body, but the overall trend, so it will fluctuate up and down, but if the overall mm -hmm. trend continues to trend downwards, that's a very important and positive sign. Should you avoid all iron-containing foods in your diet? The answer is no. You probably don't want to uh, completely ruin your life or quality of life. Uh, I think it's important to um, eat a well-balanced diet, um, mm -hmm. certainly, but um, you, don't, you don't need to take any iron supplements, that's for no. sure. <laughs> so you want to avoid those sort of things, but you don't have to completely cut out uh, let's say spinach or broccoli or or even some red meats on occasion. Okay, good. Yes, if that answers. Is your there question. anything like a natural? I know the school medicine doesn't believe in that, but I do a little bit because certain things did help me from yes. the natural point of view. Uh, yes. I was thinking about usually cleansing the liver, maybe help drinking artichoke tea or eat artichoke. I don't know. I mean, right. is there anything I can do from a uh, food or natural way to help to reduce this a little bit? Yeah, that, that's a really good question um, as well. And uh, we wish we had more clinical trials on and that. data <laughs> on a lot of these naturopathic supplements and um, what has really been talked about uh, in the past and uh, some emerging data is around things like wheat grass, for example. In your case, when you're talking about various uh, teas, um, certain teas have these uh, phytates that help to chelate iron. They bind to iron and prevent iron from being absorbed. It doesn't do really anything to the iron that you already have in the body. So it just prevents uh, more absorption of the iron that you take in your foods. So it, it's, not, it's not great, but, um, and nor do we would recommend that you go on um, some very um, unique uh, uh, herbal supplements or, or so forth, just because the lack of data, uh, uh, unfortunately. With I could wheat, find, I mean, it probably won't hurt, you know, if I drink those teas, but it right. might not have the effect I hope for. Right. So, so one of the things to also consider is that if you do want to consider herbal medications and teas is to have a discussion with your pharmacist as well. There okay. is a good reference for looking at certain medications and their impact on um, Oh, sorry, certain various herbal medications and their impact on conventional medications, which yes. you have to be very cautious about, and especially post-transplant, is that if you're on various medications like um, uh, cyclosporin, etc., uh, do those herbal medications, do they impact your uh, immune suppressing medications uh, like cyclosporin? And yeah, I'm on Jakavi still, but um, okay. definitely whatever I do, if I think about something natural, I, I verify with the um, pharmacist and also with yes. the hematologue, you know, uh, definitely. Yes, yes um, definitely. If, yes. What about CBD oil? Yeah, that's a really good question, too. CBD, as you know, <laughs> has had uh, lots and lots of um, proposed indications, if you will. Uh, it certainly has um, had uh, some subjective and objective improvement in, uh, let's say, pain control, nausea, and so forth for individuals with all different sorts of medical issues. But its use in hematologic conditions like MDS and post-transplant have not been well studied. And so, again, you shouldn't be using it routinely. 
um, for those particular purposes. Okay. Um, yes. Perfect. I thank yes. you so much. I appreciate your meeting today. It was wonderful. Thank you. Good, good information. Thank you. Thank you for your uh, questions as well. <laughs>